Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television and theater. And today is no exception as we're joined by the wonderful Marcia Stephanie Blake who's currently starring in the wonderful film, I'm Your Woman. And I wanted to dive in and start by asking you a little bit about what your process looks like when you first get that script and you're kind of deconstructing it. I know that one of your things is kind of going off into a quiet corner where you can just yeah. have no distractions, but was interested kind of like once you're in that quiet space, what does it look like in terms of the way you start analyzing the script for details that are going to be useful in deconstructing your character as you figure them out? Right. I think, um, you know, the first thing I do is I try to find any, any information. I think most actors do this. Anything that someone else says about your character or that the script says about your character. Before your character even enters the picture, a lot of, sometimes people will get talked about before they enter um, you know, the, the, the story. Um, so that's what I'll do first. I'll just take down anything that's said about my person, my character, or someone who's related to them somehow. Um, and then once my character enters, I, I do pay a lot of attention to how they enter. Cause I think you know, they said first impression thing, right? That, that first time you see someone, uh, you draw a lot of conclusions about them. Um, what was really wonderful about Terry, at least for me, I, I'm joined to characters who don't speak very much. Um, maybe it's because I myself talk so much. Um, I can't stop talking. But I love characters who convey most everything through just silence their faces. Maybe they have one big moment. And I think it, 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 it makes that moment more significant if they do have that one big thing, um, but they're not talking the whole way through. And so I really love the fact that Terry was in that way kind of an, an antithesis to Jean because she, Jean wants information. She's always asking questions. She's talking, she's trying to find out what's going on. What are you doing? Why are we doing this? Who, where are we going? Where, what am I? And Terry is just all about like, stillness and quiet. And then I'm, I'm going to answer the most important question, but we're not gonna sit here and have a whole discussion about it. Um, and I think in fact, there's even one scene that probably ended up being cut where she, it was the scene that Terry spoke the most and I think they cut it because I, I just don't know that she's that person. And it was this scene, it was a beautiful scene. I mean, Julia writes so beautifully but it was a little bit like too much information or something um, that you don't necessarily need. And so, so yeah, so that's the next thing is that I, I look for that big entrance and, and what does that say about the character? And then uh, things like, yeah, how often does this person speak? And if they don't speak a lot, why don't they? And if they do, why do they? Um, and what are they choosing to answer? Like if they choose to answer questions, what do they answer? Do they actually answer the question? Do they sort of, you know, distract from the question? All these tactics, machinations that we do as human beings, what is their thing? Um, are they a direct person? You know, th these are all, if it's a great script, it will give you all those clues, the script itself, before you even get on set and have to interact with the other actors. Because obviously a big part of any character is how, they, um, how their world sort of inter interconnects with the other people. So I can make up a whole thing about Terry and then I meet Jean and it changes because of who Jean is, right? So a lot of the work happens before, but the, the most significant work happens obviously when you're on set and you're dealing with the director and your other actors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in terms of working with Rachel Brosnahan, the two of you had worked together on stage before and she's yes. a on this project and I believe actually also was the one to, to pitch you for the role and to first think of you for this. And wanted to ask you about what the benefit is in terms of your scene partner being part of the creative decisions that are going on behind, like the extra value that that adds and also just, you know, sharing scenes with someone that you know is really there as an advocate for you in terms of your work as an actor. Oh, it makes all the difference in the world. I wish we could all get to work like this. <clears throat> um, it's one thing to, and I, and I do think that's why some, you know, some directors always choose the same people to work with or the same cast or a similar cast. And sometimes, you know, theater companies will have their company, the theater company. And just like, it, it reduces the amount of language and instruction that you need if you just have 
your own language within the company, right? And and lucky for me, I had that opportunity with Rachel on Othello, where we had spent so much time. There's so much time that you spent in a theatrical production that's so, it's more time than you'd ever spent on set. Um, you know, you're getting to know each other, you're getting to watch each other work, which you don't often get to do when you're on set. You don't, if you're not in a scene, you're not called usually, right? But in theater, you're there a lot of the times where you're you're not in a scene and watching other people work. So you get to know how somebody uh, translates information or translates direction. You just, it, there's so much information you get from just watching someone else deal with a scene even before you enter it. Um, so I already knew a lot of that about her, about how she works. Um, and then we did this, this theater piece where uh, Amelia and, and Desimone are in all the scenes together, really. Like they are with each other the whole time, you know, other than the scenes where Desimone is with Othello. So we also had that relationship where we'd already for, formed this bond um, of women, uh, very similarly like Terry and Jean, uh, these uh, women who were dealing with husbands who weren't necessarily the most forthcoming, the most truthful, um, who had somehow hurt them and they were trying to figure out what their next move was gonna be. So it's not unlike Desdemona and Emilia. Um, and then having her there, she was there on set a month before I was. So she had already developed a language with Julia. So by the time I got there, it was kind of, it was smooth sailing. Like she, she and Julia had their thing going and then I just kind of fit myself into it. I already knew Rachel and I had enough conversations with Julia that I felt like I knew her a little bit. And so we just had this little trio, it was really cool. And, and then Arinze, um, he was a little bit more in and out of our scenes, but I have to say we were a pretty tight group of people, but that speaks to Julia's, the casting and just the way the, way the piece is written. These aren't people, um, they're very reserved people. You know, um, Cal and Terry are very, reserved and they have a wall up um, for various reasons. And what's interesting is that Arinzi and I are not like that at all, I don't think. But it's it's kind of nice to have a set where like silence is appreciated mm -hmm. um, or introspection is like, it's okay to just not feel like you have to feel every, you know, every time there's a, a cut or something like you have to fill the space with chatter because we all respected that our characters were so, so quiet. Um, even our, even when Julia gave us direction, she was quiet about it. <laughs> it was a very sort of calm and quiet set. Interesting. The film is like that, I think, until yeah. it's not, until it's not, you know. I thought it's interesting that you were just mentioning how she has to be very guarded. You know, there's yeah. one of the things that's really interesting about the lens of the film is it's looking at people that have a proximity to the, the world of crime, but aren't necessarily the ones participating in it and what that effect is on them and kind of what their day to day looks like. And I was curious about the way in which you worked to understand that world, because we very rarely see that perspective in films. It's really all about who's going into the center of the action, whereas mm -hmm. this is kind of just like drawing us a little bit back to the peripheral edges of it. So kind of what tools were available to you to dive into that and research it and really understand what that would look like, especially on that emotional level with the necessity of being guarded and all the other aspects that come with that. So there is a line and it might not still be in the film and it, it's about um, so many I think I say so many quiet women. And I think that's where I started. I started thinking about the quiet women in my family, why they were quiet, what made them feel so guarded, um, what, what led to them really, it, it's interesting. I'm probably gonna say more than I should about my family here, but my aunts, my mom and my aunts went through some early childhood trauma and you can tell which one of them were old enough to have, for it to have sunk in, and then which ones weren't. Because just how the younger siblings act is so much different than how the older siblings act. Uh, my mom and her sister, Henrietta, 
um, which I love that name, is they're very quiet. Um, and it's like they've seen so much that they're always first trying to figure a way out, but always trying to figure a way through. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they don't know who to trust and they don't know who's gonna hurt them next, right? So there is this, the guardedness comes from just an imbalance in their world. And that's, that's the crime, the, the husband who's in a, you know, I think if your husband is involved in crime, you're always just, you have no idea what's going to happen next. Um, and especially, I think with Jean, it's like, we, we know she finds out eventually what's going on, but you know, as women, we kind of always know, right? Like something's not right. So I feel like she knows that something's not right. And when, when you're not settled in your own home, when you always have this feeling like something's just not right, um, I think that creates such a weird trauma. It's like, but it's so internal. It's hard to describe how my mom and my aunts are, but I, I took a lot from what I grew up seeing and wondering like, wow, how come they're so just in, uh, not internal, but weirdly, like every once in a while they'd laugh, you know, they'd be together. And when they were together, they would, there would be like huge laughter and, and maybe there would be an outburst, but it was so rare. And then I'd see their younger siblings who are just much more comfortable in their bodies and their lives and around people and chatting with people. And my mom is really, really shy. And it's, it, it, it's, it's weird. I do think it either makes you um, very vulnerable and soft, right? And scared, or it makes you tough. And I feel like what I took, because if you look at my, my aunts and my mom, I think my mom is like the very vulnerable, soft version of it. And then my aunts are a little bit tougher. So I think Terry is like my aunts. Terry is the one who took it and said, "This I'm not going to allow this to happen to me again. I'm going to protect my family, protect my son. I'm getting out and this is how I'm gonna do it. Um, and there were probably was a day where that decision was made and then she was out, right? And I think Jean is, is a little bit like, I, I want to, something's weird, it's not right. I definitely feel like something's going on with my husband and then he comes home and, he does this thing that makes her feel even more vulnerable, but she's trying to figure it out. You know, it's an imbalance. There's always like an imbalance. Um, but yeah, I think Terry's, Terry's crossed that bridge and gone through all of that. And now she's the person who has decided to take control of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that imbalance between them is, is so great to watch on screen. And especially with your character, Terry, with her kind of gradually deciding that she is going to trust the character of Jean, which is Rachel yes. one. Um, and it kind of like eventually comes down to like that amazing two-hander scene where it's just the two of you sitting at the table and you're finally kind of giving your backstory and giving your history. And I, so I wanted to ask you about how you thought about the way in which you gradually wanted to build up to that moment and then what it looked like in terms of just like preparing going into a scene like that, that was giving so much rich detail for your character. Um, you know, it, it, it reminded me of discussions I'd had with Rachel. Uh, I don't think that as a person, I don't, I don't know that I'm that much different from Terry. There, there aren't people that I sort of trust just right away. Um, and I think that kind of conversation happens from uh, like extreme fear. Uh, I don't know that Terry would have shared that much with Jean had she not felt such apprehension about why they were in that hotel room at that table. And then she was, she felt like she had to share with someone that she was scared. She's not a person who would ever say that I'm scared. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen next. And I think 
the fact that Jean was there and she realized that Jean was safe is why she shared that information. Um, and working up to that, it's obviously Rachel is a wonderful actress, but I think Rachel's eyes are like, <laughs> they're like the, the, um, the windows to her little soul. Her eyes are so big and she is so, I, and I knew this being on stage with her that whatever she's feeling is like right, right here. And all you have to do, and they say this about, you know, actors, like if you're feeling un, um, just unsure in a scene and you trust your scene partner, just look into their eyes, right? And I knew that about Rachel. And I knew that if, if I made that connection with her or if Terry made that connection with Jean, all I had to do was look into her eyes. I'm, I'm seeing whatever I'm feeling in her eyes. Um, and so the fear was there and the vulnerability was there and the, the um, and also this welcome, like, please tell me, I will keep your secret. I will guard it with my life, like how I guard my own secrets and I will honor it. Like it's all there in the, you know, in her little blue eyes or her, actually her gigantic big blue eyes. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I, I just, I trusted her. I trusted Julia. It's, it's always interesting to be vulnerable on set. Um, if you're the kind of actor who really like um, really goes there, um, you want to feel safe, like you're in a safe environment. And I felt very safe with Julia and with Rachel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the other scenes that I wanted to specifically ask you about was the scene where they go to the club and, and there's a shootout that happens because the way it's filmed is so stunning. And it's really just like the camera in one shot following down a hallway, going into a space, kind of pulling back into another location. Um, and there's times where it's like in the middle of the action, there's time where times where the camera's just like sitting around the corner. So we're just audibly hearing it. And so I wanted to ask about what that looked like in terms of, of just mapping out the choreography of that scene and, and it coming together. Okay, so that was the first scene I shot. And it was insane. And I can't, believe, I mean, it's so beautiful, but it started with, you know, um, the clothing we were wearing. We were both so excited about our outfits. When you see this film, you'll see what I've done around. Our outfits are amazing in the, in the club scene. And then they drive us to, to set and it's this club that's like set, you know, it has the, the disco balls and it's set up like an old school dance hall in the 70s. Everyone is dressed, period. It's so awesome. Everyone is dressed, period. It's like disco balls and just um, platform shoes. I, I kept taking Polaroids of all the extras. There were 300 extras. It was crazy. It was like the best day ever. It was such a good day to start. Um, 300 extras, it was freezing cold, but no one cared. Um, or at least they cared, but they looked so cute. They were like, well, whatever. Um, and then it's just music going. And I, fe I felt like I am in this, we talk about like your first day, just throwing you into a world. I was in that world immediately. And it was so awesome. And then to see it when we did the playback, to see how beautiful it was. Like it's just shot beautifully, like you said. And it feels so right. Like I, even that hallway, you know what I'm talking about? The hallway that we're coming with the, the phone boobs are, there's like phone booths, like who's seen, a, who, you know, who's seen a phone booth in forever? But there's like phone booths and, it, and it's smoky and the colors on the wall, it's like this weird pinks and oranges. And it was, it was, pretty amazing and that I don't know what they did to set it up and I don't even want to know I'm sure it took them hours and days and all I know is I was thrown thrown right into the world I felt like it was exactly what I needed to get into this life this 1970s you know environment uh and then our clothes were fabulous <laughs> No, the costumes are so impeccable in that moment in particular. Oh, good. But everyone, the extras, everyone, oh my gosh. And the hair, just everyone just, the A game was brought that day, man. You knew it was, it was amazing. Was once you walked onto set and made that scene happen. I was like, this is it. And it was free. I mean, I kept asking the extras if they were okay because 
and, and I shouldn't say extras, the background actors, um, because they're so like not extra, right? We, we need them. They're not extra, <laughs> they're necessary actors. Um, but it was freezing cold. It was one of the coldest days just out of nowhere. It dropped to like 16 degrees and they were wearing, you know, party clothes and they had to keep sort of moving them out. We moved them out for lunch and then we had to bring everybody back in. And so they're going outside in their party clothes in 16 degree weather. It was a little crazy. Um, but that set was so loving and welcoming and I think they really made an effort to make sure that everyone felt like they were part of everything. And I was, you know, I was cold too. Rachel was cold. So it wasn't like we were put in some special place and kept warm and then everybody else was freezing. Like we were all freezing together. So even that alone, that too is like, this is a part of creating this camaraderie and this set and a company. We talked about company before, like a company of actors where everybody feels respected and loved and and um, you know, equal. Mm -hmm. Because the way that you were you were talking about, you know, working with Rachel as a scene partner and being able to just like look in someone's eyes and really kind of how much that gives your own performance, you know, in terms of other relationships that Terry has that I was really interested by were the ones that she has with Cal and Eddie, because there's such a unique aspect to that as a performer, because you're not on screen with them. Right. But it's such a storied history that you still have to bring forth. So, so what's what's the unique approach that you have to bring when you when you have moments like that where you're developing a relationship but you're doing it single handedly essentially? Hmm. I think that's where maybe silences come in too, um, especially if you don't have much to say. There isn't much that I actually say about Eddie. Um, so a lot of it is just a look. Um, or a, a breath, a pause. Um, it's weird. I think more than more than with theater, with film, if you just feel something, it'll show. <laughs> and so with Eddie, it was mostly about how I felt about him um, more than what I said. And then with Cal, I said, I said, a, uh, I'm trying to remember. I actually don't think I said very much about Cal either. Um, but again, it's like you change, you change whatever the feeling is that's coming up through your face, through your eyes, right? So with Eddie, it's one thing that's not good. That's my ex husband, you guys. And then with Cal, who is the love of my life, it's something else, you know? And it doesn't matter really what you say. Um, it's how you say it, mm -hmm. right? I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> no, you did, and I feel like it was like a demonstration of it as well, which is amazing. They're both both guys are actually quite lovely, and it was hard to think of Eddie as an asshole really um but i did it uh but bill is actually a really nice guy <laughs> on the different side of things i wanted to talk a little bit about the episode that you did on genji cohen's new show social distance okay. that you watched during quarantine because you know i was i was really fascinated in what that looks like in terms of a performance because it's very different to being on set with everybody else. Obviously you had to take on crew positions as well. You were the lighting department, the audio department, the DP, your daughter was acting in it. So you were thinking about your performance, but also hers. But even just in terms of, of the logistics of shooting a scene, you know, particularly with your character when she's teaching students, you know, did you find yourself having to rely auditorially a lot more because you know if you think about it right now I'm looking at your face but I'm not looking at the camera but in right. film scenes in this way you would have had to not be looking at your fellow castmates at certain points I imagine so what in were the fact, came in, in that way in fact there were a lot of times where my castmates weren't there because they were shooting me so I had to be pretending that I was, you know, in a Zoom meeting and speaking to people, but the camera that was actually in front of me was recording me. So there were plenty of times where I was hearing an actor 
uh, or it was actually coming through the computer, but I wouldn't be seeing them. Uh, I think only a couple of times where was I actually interacting with the, with the person in, uh, in the moment, but it would be, you know, they would shoot my, my side and then they shoot the other person's side. And just the way we had to do it with the Zoom is that a lot of times you couldn't see who you were talking to. So it definitely was mostly auditory. Um, and it, it, I have to say, I have to say, I am as surprised as anyone else that we pulled this thing off. <laughs> there were so many things that could have gone horribly wrong. And as we were shooting, I was like, there's no way this is gonna work. And just even trying to explain to my six-year-old how, you know, what I just said, that I know you can't see the person. So she'd be like, well, I'm supposed to be talking to so-and-so, but he's not there. And I'm like, I know, you just have to just trust me. He's gonna be there. You just have to pretend I'm gonna put the sticker right here and look at this sticker that's him, talk to the sticker, or you can hear him. And then sometimes it wasn't even, um, very occasionally, it wouldn't even be the actor reading the lines. It would be someone else, you know, uh, which, you know, that happens on set. Sometimes you'll get a, a stand in to, to do the turnaround or whatever. Um, so a lot of times it wasn't even the actor. So it would be supposed to, it was supposed to be a male student and a, and a female was reading the lines. That was, you know, that's a little bit like off-putting. And then to try to explain that to a six-year-old was crazy. Um, but we figured it out. I'm not sure how. These people are professionals. They're geniuses. They put it together and it looks like a TV show and it's great. I have no idea. We had no idea what we were going to end up with. I just lost my light. Speaking of which, I need a lighting, lighting. <laughs> um, so here, I know these, these Zoom things that we're doing too, the Zoom press is very similar to me shooting social distance uh, on my own. I just literally lost my light. I'm gonna try to fix it while we talk. And I, I believe that your 10 year old has also expressed interest in the filmmaking side of things and, and was interested in after going through that experience, is that something that they're still interested in or did it kind of shine a little too much of a light? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I weirdly think it made it even, it solidified it in her brain. Uh, I wanted, I secretly wanted it to discourage her. Um, just because I was like, oh God, do I need any more people in showbiz in my house? Um, but no, she was super into it. She saved us. My husband and my my oldest, who weren't in the actual show, did a lot of work outside of it. Um, my husband was all the things you said. I, I didn't set up those cameras. I don't know how to set up a camera. My husband did all of that. Uh, he set up, he, he was called, his call time would be before mine. He was called before us so that he could set everything up, set all the, cause we had, um, we had computers with Zoom for the crew, for a production crew. Then we had computers that were cameras, I think. Then we had iPhone cameras, then we had real cameras. So he would set all of that up and then he would get our sound equipment and he put sound on us. <clears throat> he was doing all of that. And then my, my oldest would was his PA basically. She would help him and then she would you know, do the, the clapper, the thingy, the clapper thingy. <laughs> what is that thing called? I always forget what it's called, it's so horrible. Um, but she was she was there and she would always put the right, you know, the right uh, scene number and take in her little chalk. She was super excited about it. She loved it. Um, and yeah, I thought the amount of work that it was would discourage her, but it did not. Much to my chagrin. She just wants to do it more. And now she's like, well, I know how to do lights. I know how to do sound. I'm like, slow down. You, <laughs> you don't really know how to do lights and sound. That was a crash course. And if you really had to do it for real, it would be a lot more. You have to go to school for this stuff, but okay. Um, but yeah, she's not discouraged at all. Yeah, no, well, it turned out, it turned out amazingly. And I want to thank you so much for, for talking a little bit about that, but so much in depth about the movie. It's so fantastic. And I hope that everybody watching this conversation, if they haven't already, will, will take the chance to, to watch it right now. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. It's nice to talk to you.